Perfect. First of all, let's talk a bit about this report. I know you launched it in February and you um, highlighted your expectations for growth in across the world. And I think it's very interesting to note that of the countries, of, of the five European countries that are listed among the top 10 economies today, by 2050, you project that there'll be absolutely none on that list. That's absolutely right. Uh, the reason for that is that in terms of size, uh, what matters if technology is ultimately freely transferable, transferable across boundaries, mm -hmm. it's population that matters. Right. And uh, now that uh, the rest of the world has learned how to apply best practice technology in any kind of application, uh, Europe's days as the largest economies of the world um, are well and truly over. In terms of per capita income, of course, in terms of economic well-being, they still be doing okay, even mm. by 2050, however. Mm. Okay, let's talk a bit about um, where we go from here for, for the classification, class, should I say classifying economies? Because mm -hmm. a lot has been said about the BRICS, and some suggest that it should be the BRICS now. In fact, some say maybe we should even be dropping Brazil in a few years. What are your thoughts on how we read emerging economies today? Well, one has to adopt classification schemes as an aid to thinking, not as a, a straitjacket to force things in and cute acronyms like BRICS or whatever else, uh, unless they add insight, don't mean anything. So, for instance, in a follow-up study to the one that you're talking about here, the global growth generators, where we looked at global trade developments, we found that looking at Asia uh, and putting just Japan separate from the rest made no economic sense because in Asia were both a large number of emerging countries uh, the, going very fast, some rather low levels of productivity, and some very mature economies like Korea, Singapore, um, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, as well as Japan. So we put the mature ones together and defined a category called Emerging Asia. And you can do the same uh, uh, for Africa and the other continent. And uh, no, um, this country here, Nigeria, would definitely be somewhere halfway between uh, emerging markets and uh, frontier economies. I think with good hopes of making it into the emerging market category. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about the opportunity that Nigeria, obviously you mentioned it now, um, you expect it to be the leader by far in the, on the African continent by 2050. Talk to us about the imperatives, what we need to do, because a lot of people talk a bit about the fact that Nigeria is already growing at such a rapid pace without uh, infrastructure, um, but then I think there, there is, there's a risk to that because people tend to feel it's going to continue that way if we don't make the right policies in place. No, a lot of this is also oil driven and therefore by definition not sustainable because oil is an exhaustible resource. Once yeah. it's gone, it's gone. Now, uh, in terms of uh, no, sustainable uh, wealth creation, the country needs to continue along the avenues of openness to the rest of the world through trade, yeah. through mobility of people and ideas, capital flows, FDI. It also uh, needs to greatly increase the domestic investment rate from in the low 20s as a share of GDP to the 30s. And that should be mostly not in residential construction, but in plant, equipment and infrastructure. And the third key thing among these is infrastructure. You're never going to have a globally competitive uh, manufacturing sector unless infrastructure uh, gets br brought up to a decent level. And then among the infrastructure, of course, uh, electric power, both generation, you know, uh, distribution and transmission are, are key. Finally, human capital formation. You know, mm. Teach your children well, as the song says. Uh, you have to get the numeracy, the literacy and the modern skills, the modern professional and vocational skills that are essential to get up to the next level. But you can do it through a variety of, 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 of sectors and vehicles that haven't been used by other countries. For instance, agriculture uh, is to a large extent still very small scale and often subsistence in this country. If this could be you know, commercialized, economies of scale you know, reaped and uh, you know, modern technology uh, applied, 
this could be a powerhouse uh, for agricultural production, yeah. freeing labor from the agricultural sector for the manufacturing and services sectors. And for the broader African continent, what are your thoughts on what we should be focusing on? I think right now, when we look at trade flows, a lot of it is export of commodities, yeah. and one argue that we import everything else. Uh, no, I think that's something of an exaggeration, but uh, no doubt, no, the continent has been blessed uh, by uh, with natural resources of all kinds, both renewable and non-renewable ones. One should make use of these. There's no point in not extracting oil if you have it, right? Or gold or diamonds or agricultural commodities. But at the same time, you don't want to get locked in to them, in part because in the case of, of oil, it's, it's exhaustible, but also because it doesn't create any sort of dynamic external economies uh, of knowledge creation and skill enhancement. It employs very few people. So what you should do is, of course, go and strive for a diversified economy uh, that doesn't require a lot of industrial planning necessarily. It requires infrastructure, education, good governance, uh, rule of law, and a predictable economic environment in which entrepreneurship is rewarded. Then the people of Nigeria and Africa at large will find out where to put their, their money to work and where to put their, uh, their, their skills to work. Oh.